Greetings! Welcome to Electronics 2. My name is Bezad Razavi and this is lecture number 12. Today we will extend our studies of the bipolar differential pair to the MOS differential pair. So we'll go over some general properties of this circuit and then we will delve into its large signal behavior, meaning its input-output characteristic, and see if we can derive an equation for it. Now, before we go there, let's just uh, summarize what we did uh, last time in the previous lecture. Okay, so in the previous lecture, we uh, tried to extend this notion of a point of symmetry and AC ground in the small signal analysis of differential pairs. And we saw that, for example, even if we have degeneration resistors, this turns out to be a point of symmetry. So for small differential volt cha voltage changes here, this point is AC ground, so the circuit reduces to one half circuit like this, whose voltage gain can be readily written. And of course we have seen this a number of times, that the voltage gain of the half circuit, this, is the same as the differential voltage gain of the entire differential pair. It's the same expression. Okay. Uh, then we looked at this example where we have this just independent resistor connected between X and Y. <clears throat> and again, we try to find a point of symmetry by breaking this into two halves and uh, <coughs> excuse me, providing an AC ground here. So we saw that with this AC ground, I can readily write the voltage gain again for this half circuit here where these two are in parallel. But another important result was that, well, if this point is AC ground, and this point is AC ground, I can just connect them together. So now the circuit looks like this, from a small signal point of view. Uh, these uh, terminals of these resistors are connected the same down here. Uh, and these are called RL over 2, because we just got them from here. But then I thought, okay, I can change the name of the resistors, I change it to RO, and that reflects the effect of early effect in these transistors. So we saw that to find the voltage gain, again we just place RO in parallel with RC and multiply it by minus GM. Okay, today we will uh, uh, go to mass differential pairs and see uh, what we can do there. Uh, the mass differential pair is very similar to the bipolar counterpart. Here's what we have. Two identical MOS transistors uh, with a tail current source. And now we call this ISS, not IEE. SS means connected to source, source, right? And then these are called RD for the drain resistor on each side. And then we have two inputs and two outputs. So you would like to perform the same studies that we did for the bipolar pair here as well. But uh, we don't really have to go through every detail because many of the concepts are similar. So we'll just proceed and explore. Okay, so let's talk about the general properties. In the first case, uh, like the bipolar differential pair, we just connect the inputs together and connect to a battery. Okay, so here's what we have. The differential pair. And I connect these two together and hold it at a battery voltage, some battery. And again, if you remember, we call this the input common mode level, VCM. Okay, we need some DC there, so they're just connected to some DC. For example, if the supply is, uh, let's say, uh, 1 volt, this could be maybe 0.8 or 0.7 volts, something like that, this battery. All right, uh, okay, so what's going on here in this case exactly? Well, if the circuit is symmetric, and we see that M1 and M2 have the same gate voltages, and the same source voltages. So this current has to split equally between M1 and M2. 
So again, like the bipolar differential pair, we have a current of I S S over two on this side and on this side, I S S over two. All right, so that's pretty easy. Okay, uh, again, we're assuming that these transistors operate in saturation. Remember, for MOSFETs, we need to be in saturation so that they have a high transconductance. They become good amplifying devices. So we're assuming that M1 and M2 are saturated. Okay, what else can we find here? Well, how much is Vx and how much is Vy? Uh, well, the voltage drop from here to here is Is over 2 times Rd. This is subtracted from VDD to give us Vx, and same with Vy. So Vx is equal to Vy is equal to VDD minus Rd ISS over 2. Okay, that's easy enough. All right. <clears throat> now, here's the next question that we need to answer. How much is the VGS here? VGS1. Now, we expect that, of course, these have the same VGS because their gates are shorted and so are the sources. So VGS1 is the same as VGS2. How much is VGS1 if I know this current? All right. Well, let's look at M1. M1 is a MOS device. It is in saturation, and it has a drain current equal to ISS over 2. So I should be able to find the gate source voltage necessary for the transistor to carry that much current. And for that, I'm going to write my general equation. ID is equal to 1 half mu N C ox W over L VGS minus VTH squared. Again, we are neglecting channel length modulation. Okay, so uh, for M1, which is in saturation, ID is equal to ISS over 2. So if I plug in ISS over 2, I can find VGS. So I can say VGS1 is equal to. So this is ISS over 2. That factor of 1 half goes away with this. We divide by this, take the square root, and take VTH to the other side. So that will give us ISS over mu N C ox W over L plus VTH. Okay, so that's the gate source bias voltage of M1 and M2. We don't have any signals, any differential signals coming in, so we have some amount of current in the device, some amount of VGS. Those are the bias conditions. All right, uh, a few uh, terms that we have used in the past. Uh, one is VGS minus VTH, so I want to emphasize what this was called. So VGS minus VTH, this term itself, is called the overdrive voltage. If you remember from electronics one, overdrive voltage, okay, VGS minus VTH. That's the overdrive voltage. Uh, one other term that we will use, uh, actually I should have said it for the bipolar differential pair as well, but we'll say it here. So we say if V in 1 is equal to V in 2, maybe approximately equal to V in 2. Well, okay, let me be precise. I'll just say they are equal for now. If they are equal, we say the uh, differential pair is in equilibrium, is in equilibrium. Okay, this is true for the bipolar differential pair and for the mass differential pair. It doesn't make any difference. But uh, it's good to have a term for this because we repeatedly come back to this condition where the gates are connected, so V in 1 minus V in 2 is 0, right? And we have some conditions that we have found for this case, for the equilibrium case. So it's good to remember that. Okay, so we found different things. Uh, uh, this VGS, the currents, these voltages, uh, it's pretty good, right? We're pretty comfortable with what the circuit 
looks like right now before any differential signals come in. Um, one more quantity that would be useful to have is the equilibrium overdrive voltage. Which is just VGS minus VTH, right? Of this one or that one, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be, so VGS 1 minus VTH, that's the overdrive voltage, mm -hmm. is how much? We'll just bring this to the other side, it's that, right? So it's just uh, ISS over mu N C ox W over L. Okay, just a quantity to have available for later calculations. Uh, at this point, we don't exactly know why that's necessary and what's the big deal, but we will see later. All right, so we have found all these parameters for the circuit under equilibrium, meaning when these two are shorted and we just have a common mode voltage. Um, now, we can make the same observations as we did for the bipolar structure. For example, if this voltage changes a little bit, uh, what changes here? Okay, so we're going to ask this question. If V in CM, sorry, V CM in, uh, I don't remember if I always say V in CM or V CM in. I think it's usually V CM in. So if V CM in changes, by some amount, what quantities in the circuit change? Okay, which quantities change? Well, uh, because we still have symmetry, ISS still divided equally between left and right, so that current is still ISS over 2, this current is still ISS over 2. This voltage is still the same as before, this voltage is the same as before, so these voltages don't change. Uh, does this VGS change? No, because the VGS only depends only on ISS. ISS uh, the, the, tail, uh, the bias current of each of these, the bias current didn't change, the ID, right? ID didn't change, so VGS doesn't change. So, nothing changes. So the answer is nothing changes. Now, if you're very curious, there's one quantity that does change, and that's this voltage, node P, okay? When this goes up and down. But don't worry about it. It's not a big deal at this point. All right, so just like the differential pair in bipolar technology, we can say that this circuit does not respond to perturbations in the common mode uh, level at the input, right? As this goes up and down, nothing changes. The circuit completely rejects those things. All right, so uh, that's uh, some of the basic stuff that we can learn here. Now let's go and uh, look at the uh, differential characteristics. So I'm going to go to part two and uh, differential behavior. So again, just very generally, very intuitively, we're not writing equations yet. Okay, so this time I have the differential pair and I am allowing V in 1 and V in 2 to change uh, differentially. So V in 1, for example, goes up, V in 2 goes down, and we would like to see what the circuit does. So x and y, and here is p, iss, and so on, and that's vdd. Okay, well, uh, what we can imagine is if v in 1 is very positive with respect to v in 2, so this is quite higher on this side, then m1 
completely turns on, M2 completely turns off, and all of the ISS goes to the left. Similarly, if V in 2 is very high and V in 1 is very low, M2 is completely on, M1 is completely off, all of the current flows this way. All right? Okay. So then if I just try to sketch uh, the currents of the transistors as a function of V in 1 minus V in 2, uh, at a 0, we have equal currents, right? We have ISS over 2. So they're both at ISS over 2. If uh, V in 1 is uh, quite higher than V in 2, if V in 1 is quite higher than V in 2, M1 takes all of ISS. So ID1 is equal to ISS over here. This is ID1. And ID2 is 0. So ID2 is down here. And because of symmetry, we have the same story, but reverse on the other side. So this uh, goes down like this, and this goes down like this. Okay? So that's what we also had for the case of the bipolar differential pair. Nothing has changed. Of course, the shape of this curve might not be the same as the shape that we had, the exponential shape that we have for the bipolar case. But the general uh, extreme values and uh, this value are similar. Okay. Uh, by the same token, we can try to plot Vx and Vy. So again, what we see is that uh, uh, V in 1 minus V in 2. We can plot Vx and Vy, or we can plot Vx minus Vy, which is of greater interest to us. And we have, what we have discovered are these. When V in 1 minus V in 2 is 0, so when we have this situation, Vx and Vy are 0, so Vx minus Vy is 0. So we are here. Okay. When V in 1 minus V in 2 is very positive, uh, M1 takes all the current, uh, Vx comes down to VDD minus RD times ISS, all of ISS. So we are here. So we have minus RD ISS. The difference between X and Y will be minus RD ISS because X has come down and Y has gone up to R VDD. And by symmetry on this side, it will be plus RD ISS. So the general shape of the input output characteristic looks like this, right? It is unlikely that this shape will be a hyperbolic tangent shape. Because if you remember, the hyperbolic tangent came from the exponential characteristics of the bipolar transistors used in the differential pair. Here we have MOS transistors. The characteristics are of this nature. So this exact shape will be something else. But in the extremes over here and over here, it looks similar to the case of the bipolar differential pair. Okay, very good. So, so far, we've seen these uh, basic things. Um, all right. Uh, now, before we uh, go any further, I also wanted to make sure that we know when this equation is valid. This is something we saw in Electronics 1, but I want to emphasize, so let me change the color of my pen. I want to emphasize that this equation is valid if the transistor is, first of all, on. It has to be on, right? So, if device is on and in saturation, right? How do we know if the device is on? Well, VGS of the device has to be at least equal to VTH, the threshold, or higher, right? So if VGS is less than VTH, this equation would give us some number, but that's wrong, right? Because we know that this equation applies only if VGS is greater than VTH, okay, or equal to VTH. So that's the condition we have to remember. And of course, it has to be in saturation. So anytime we want to use this equation, we must remember 
because later on we will see that if we don't remember that this equation applies to the device only when the device is on, we could get wrong results. So remember that. Okay, so I would like to go over an example before we go any farther. So again, our objective is to derive an equation for this. Just like that hyperbolic tangent that we had for bipolar differential pair, we want to see what this is, right? Because that would be very useful. But before we go there, I want to show you something else. So, uh, what is the minimum value of v in 1 minus v in 2 at which 1 transistor turns off. Okay, so here's the situation. I am gradually creating an imbalance here, right? It's going up, it's going down. So there's a, some uh, difference between V1 and V2. So in other words, I'm traveling, for example, this way or this way. So I would like to know uh, the minimum voltage, the minimum difference that uh, uh, makes one transistor off. So you can see here that, for example, as I go this way, this current goes up and this current comes down. And at some voltage, I need to go zero, to zero, exactly to zero, as long as we use these simple equations. So how much voltage do I need for ID2 to go to exactly zero? What's the minimum voltage? Okay, so we're going to calculate that. Again, that's some number that would be useful in our future studies. All right, so how do I do that? Well, let's just uh, draw M1 and M2 together. And so let's say V in 1 is going higher. So V in 1 is high. And I will draw this down here so that uh, pictorially you have some idea as to why M1 is on and why M2 is off. So this voltage is lower, so we draw it lower. This is M1 and M2. Okay, so of course we have the rest of the circuit I'm not showing, the resistors and so forth. But I'm looking at these currents and I'm increasing V in 1 and decreasing V in 2. And at some point I see that the current through M2 is just dropping to zero, right here. Okay? Then I'm asking how much is V in 1 minus V in 2? Well, if the current of M2 is just approaching zero, how much VGS do we have for M2? This VGS. VGS2. Remember, M2 is about to turn off, and it is in saturation. So we can use this equation and say, if ID is going to zero, VGS is approaching VTH. So VGS2 has to be equal to VTH. It's really VTH2, but we're assuming that M1 and M2 have the same VTH. Okay, so uh, where we are here, uh, this guy has a VGS equal to VTH. How about this guy? How much is the VGS here? Okay, well, VGS1. We need to find VGS1. M1 is on. It is in saturation. It has certain current. How much is the current? All of ISS. So we should be able to find its VGS, again according to this equation or this equation, right? So the current is equal to ISS, not ISS over 2, ISS. And I'm looking for VGS. So I'm going to write VGS1 equals, so this ISS, I get 2 ISS over this, then take the square root, then bring VTH to the other side. So that would be 2 ISS over mu n c ox w over l plus vth. <clears throat> okay. 
Okay, so that's the gate source voltage of M1. All right, so M1 has all of the tail current. M2 has a current very close to zero. And uh, these are the two VGSs that we have. Can I find V in 1 minus V in 2? Sure. I can say V in 1 minus VGS1 is this voltage. V in 2 minus VGS2 is this voltage. And those are equal. So just like the case of the bipolar differential pair, I can say V in 1 minus V in 2 is equal to VGS1 minus VGS2. And uh, uh, so this is really because this voltage here is equal to V in 1 minus VGS1, right? I have this voltage with respect to ground. I subtract this much, I get this voltage, right? And if I come this way, this voltage, the same voltage, will be V in 2 minus VGS2. Right? This voltage minus this voltage gives me this voltage. So these two have to be equal. So if I, I equate these two and I bring this one to this side, that one to this side, I get that. Okay, very good. So V in 1 minus V in 2. This is the minimum differential voltage necessary to turn off one side is given by VGS1 minus VGS2. VGS1 is this, VGS2 is this, this VTH cancels, all we are left over with is <coughs> 2 ISS over mu N C ox W over L. Okay, so this is the minimum voltage necessary to turn off one side of the differential pair. Again, these numbers right now don't seem much, they're a little abstract, but that's okay. As we go forward, we will see why they are interesting and useful. Okay, let's see. Uh, we are ready now to start the large signal analysis of the differential pair. So let's go to the next slide and see what we can do. Okay. All right, so large signal analysis. So again, our objective is to find an equation for Vx minus Vy in terms of V in 1 minus V in 2. All right, so we have to draw this again. Uh, this time is a MOS structure. So we have ISS here, V in 1 here, V in 2 here, RD here, and RD here, and X, and Y, and M1, and M2. All right. So our approach is somewhat similar to what we took for the bipolar differential pair. Remember what we did? We started from here and wrote a KVL in this loop. So it'll be similar. So what we'll say is that this voltage is equal to V in 1 minus VGS1, as we just saw a minute ago. And again, it's the same as V in 2 minus VGS2. So that tells me that V in 1 minus V in 2 is equal to VGS1 minus VGS2. This is true under any condition, right? Whether these are partially on, completely on, they are in equilibrium, whatever they are, this is just a KVL. It has to hold, right? This voltage minus this voltage has to be equal to this voltage minus this voltage, right? No question about it. Okay. All right. Now, Let's suppose that both transistors are on. Maybe one has more current, the other one has less current, but again, we're assuming that they're both on. If one of them is completely off, then we cannot write any more equations, and it doesn't really matter anyway. So let's assume that the transistors are both on, and if they're both on, I have an expression for VGS1 and for VGS2 in terms of the currents that flow 
through the transistors, right? So this current is ID1 going this way. This current is ID2. Okay, so I'm going to write this as V in 1 minus V in 2. How much is VGS in terms of ID? Well, remember we had that before, right? So we have used it a number of times. So here we are. Let's see. Uh, okay. Is it here? I think it's over here. Okay, so you see that uh, uh, if I have the current in terms of VGS, I can find VGS in terms of current, and it has this uh, shape. Well, here is, uh, we just have to remember it like this. VGS is given by uh, 2 ID divided by this quantity square root plus VTH, okay? Like what we wrote here. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, do that for uh, this general circuit as we have it here. <coughs> okay, so V in one, VGS one is given by twice the current through the device, ID one. We don't know how much, is ID, how much ID one is, but it should be non-zero. Divided by mu n C ox W over L. It should be non, it could be zero, but definitely not uh, anything other than that, meaning that we're assuming the transistors are not off. If they're completely off, then these equations don't hold. So it has to be close to zero. And uh, plus VTH, so that's VGS1. And then from VGS2, I have the same story, 2ID2, mu n C ox W over L plus VTH. All right, so far so good. Okay, so what's our objective? Our objective is to find Vx minus Vy as a function of V in 1 minus V in 2. Now what we do know from this analysis or the bipolar pair analysis is this, that Vx minus Vy is equal to minus Rd ISS times V in 1 minus V in 2. Why? Well, because Vx is given by Vdd minus Rdid1. Vy is given by Vdd minus Rdid2. So if I subtract Vy from Vx, I end up with a simple expression, right? Rd, uh, sorry, this, uh, uh, okay. So let me do this. Okay, so let me write this again so that it's uh, clear. It's easier if I write it out and not skip any steps. So Vx is equal to Vdd minus Rd Id1. And Vy is equal to Vdd minus Rd Id2. So that tells me that Vx minus Vy is equal to minus Rd times Id1 minus Id2, okay? So uh, to find Vx minus Vy, all I need to do is find Id1 minus Id2. Okay, so if I find Id1, if I find Id2 and subtract them, I find Id1 minus Id2. But finally, I would like to express ID1 minus ID2 in terms of V in 1 minus V in 2. And okay, here we have something, right? We have V in 1 minus V in 2, we have ID1 and ID2. Uh, I have two unknowns, one equation. So I need one more equation, and the other equation is ID1 plus ID2. These two currents have to be equal to ISS. <coughs> So here's a system of two equations and two unknowns that we have to solve, okay? All right, so uh, this uh, solution is not that complicated. Here's how it goes. First of all, of course, this VTH 
uh, cancels with this VTH. All right. Uh, we are going to square both sides of that. So if you square, this is what we get. V in 1 minus V in 2 squared is equal to square of this minus 2 times this that times that and then square of this. So we have, I'm going to write the squares first. So 2 ID 1 over mu N C ox W over L <coughs> plus the square of this one plus <coughs> 2 ID 2 mu n c ox w over l and then uh, minus 2 times this times this so 2 times uh, square root of 4 id1 id2 and then mu n c ox w over l all right so we squared both sides Okay, so you can see that here I can factor out 2 over mu and c ox w over L and write id1 plus id2 as ISS. That's great. We're still not there because we have the square root here, right? So what we'll have to do is square this again. <coughs> but <coughs> to avoid any further complication, we're going to take this whole thing and bring it to this side. minus v in 2 so 2 times ISS divided by this 2 times ISS from here divided by mu n c ox w over l that's great uh, sorry, minus <coughs> and then is equal to minus square root of all of this so well okay we can write that as minus 4 times id1 id2 I'm going to write id2 as ISS minus id1 ISS minus id1 divided by mu n c ox w over l I hope you've been able to follow so far. I wrote ID1 plus ID2 as ISS. I brought this whole thing to the left-hand side. That's this. And then here I had this 4 which came out uh, multiplied by 2. That gave me minus 4. And then ID1 and ID2, I replaced ID2 with ISS minus ID1. Now I have one equation, one unknown, right? I have ID1, which is unknown, and I would like to express that in terms of V in 1 minus V in 2. So how do I do that? Well, we have to square this again, square this again, and we end up with a quadratic equation. We have to solve that quadratic equation to find ID1 in terms of V in 1 minus V in 2. And you should do that. This is something that you should do once in your lifetime, just to make sure how the math comes about. Okay, so we'll do that. We'll also, uh, once we have ID1, we can find ID2. And then we go ahead and find ID1 minus ID2, which is the quantity of interest to us. So I'm going to write that up here because it's a pretty long equation, ID1 minus ID2. Okay, the final result is this, one half mu n C ox W over L V in 1 minus V in 2 square root of 4 ISS over mu N C ox W over L minus V in 1 minus V in 2 squared okay that's what we get for the differential current uh, as a function of the input differential voltage. Now, of course, we are interested finally in Vx minus Vy, but because I have ID1 minus ID2, I just multiply it by minus Rd to find that. That's not a big deal. So whatever we discover for the shape of that plot, 
will also apply to this, except that it's multiplied by minus rd. Okay, very good. So that is the equation for the large signal behavior of the differential pair. All right, well, this equation seems a lot more complicated than the hyperbolic tangent that we derived for the bipolar differential pair, right? Uh, but uh, as we dig into it, we will see that actually it's not that complicated, okay? We just have to understand it piece by piece. If you do, then eventually you sort of memorize the whole equation and you know why everything is there, why you have all these different values, coefficients, fractions, terms, everything in there. Okay, so uh, we need to understand this equation better. Uh, rather than just try to plot it, we'll look at it piece by piece slowly and see what it does. Okay, so a few observations. Number one, ID1 minus ID2 is zero if v in one equals v in two. Of course, as expected, right? So if these two voltages are equal, then this splits equally. These two are equal, the difference is zero. All right, so that's not a big deal. Okay, but what's more curious is the term inside the square root. What's going on here? Uh, this says that I have a positive number minus a positive number. So if this positive number is large enough, it seems that these will cancel each other and ID1 minus ID2 goes to zero again. Isn't that strange? So what this would predict is this, that if I try to plot ID1 minus ID2, and of course Vx minus Vy has the same behavior, right? So it says that if you try to plot ID1 minus ID2, it's zero here. Then it goes and does something we don't know, and then it comes back to zero. Because if this is large enough, these cancel each other, we get zero, right? Now that is very strange. Uh, we don't expect the circuit to do that, right? How could that be? As this voltage keeps increasing, uh, this current monotonically wants to go to the left, right? It's just uh, the current prefers to go to the stronger MOSFET, so to speak, so it, it will keep going to the left. And eventually, all of the current should go flow, flow from here. Why does that predict that something strange is going on? Okay, well, the reason is that uh, this equation is not valid for very large values of V in 1 minus V in 2. Okay, why? Well, because if V in 1 minus V in 2 exceeds a certain amount, then one transistor turns off. If one transistor turns off, we can no longer write this equation for it. Remember, the quadratic equation that we had, 1 half mu n C ox W over L VGS minus VTH squared, is applicable only if the MOS device is on and in saturation. But when eventually one of these transistors turns off, we are no longer, that equation is no longer valid. So this equation is valid up to some point, but beyond that point, we can't use this equation. And where is that point? How much V in 1 minus V in 2 can we tolerate before that equation breaks down? Well, we found the minimum V in 1 minus V in 2 that steered all this current to one side on the previous slide, remember? So in that example, we spent some time and calculated the amount of, uh, sorry here, uh, the amount of current uh, that, the amount of voltage that was necessary, remember the minimum voltage? And it looked like this. So the minimum voltage necessary to steer all the current to one side is given by this value. If V in 1 minus V in 2 exceeds this value, M2 will be off. We can no longer write those equations for M2, 
So the big equation on the next page is not valid anymore. So we're going to remember this, okay, two ISS over something, right? So let's remember that, and let's go back to this slide. Okay, so I'm going to write uh, equation one, we'll call this uh, equation A, this is A, is valid only if M1 and M2 are on or at the edge of turning off. And that means up to V in 1 minus V in 2 equals two ISS over mu n C ox W over L. 